Brian, back to uh, 2022 and even actually 23 and 24. Brian Kelly, his average recruiting classes were blank. I'm guessing eight, nine in the country if you averaged them all out, something in that range. Eight to 12 and on getting average. Better. Yeah. And getting uh, better. No, nah, they were kind better. of, he was kind of okay. stagnating. I mean, they okay. were kind of like the eight to 10 range. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I could, I could, I mean, I, I've got it right here. If you kind of look at their rankings when he was, when he was here, just like the 24 seven composite. Uh, actually, where did I have that? Here we go. That was something different. They were 10, 12, 9, 10, 13. I mean, it was kind of like in that range the whole time. If you look at the composite ranking last year's was different. They finished sixth last year, but we know why that was because it was driven by the defensive class, which was driven by Marcus Freeman. So uh, 13, they had a great class. That was the class that finished third. Since then, it was just, it was kind of consistently in that, you know, that eight to eight to 13 range. So what I'm getting to here is that I think for the average college football fan, they say, okay, if you're bringing in the eighth or ninth best class year after year, coach them up a little bit and you can make up the gap. It's not that big a deal and compete seriously compete for national championships. I have outlined for a number of people recently that the gap between, so for example, last year's Ohio State class at four and Michigan's class at eight is the same gap as between eight and 24. If you look at the points total, it cascades and drifts and goes off the cliff rather drastically after the top three or four. Uh, the difference between one and eight last year is the same difference as between eight and 40. My point being, we see Brian Ke Kelly as a good recruiter and his staff's doing a good job. Okay, Brian, <laughs> Brian's disagreeing with me. On the surface, he's bringing in top eight to 12 classes in the country. Mm -hmm. Marcus Freeman, you gave us one indicator as to why this is improved. And up until a day ago, the number one class in the country, we'll see where they land. I would expect in the top five. You mentioned effort, just flat out effort. Number two, I have to think, and just having never met the two men, and but but seeing how they relate to people, how they speak with and communicate with people, that Marcus Freeman's just more relatable to a sure. seventeen to twenty-one year old. Yeah. Um, and then beyond that, is the, is there anything else that he's doing and his staff is doing that was not done before well it's it's more of a top to bottom success i think is the thing is is brian kelly always had a few good really good recruiters i mean you know matt will, matt will probably tell you about some battles that, that usc lost when they were decent to mike dembrock who did a great job going out west and, and taking kids and i've got a classic t shepherd story that i've shared about how he was able to you know usc was trying to get t to flip and and he did some good things and there's always three or four good recruiters on the staff but then there's guys that were just taking up air you know, and, and, but there's no accountability. Right. And that was the, that was the big problem that I had. And I, I know Mark, we've kind of talked about this before. I, I think Brian Kelly has recruited successfully because, because of some of those coaches and then also some of the success that they have had, which has been driven in my opinion, largely by a watered down schedule compared to what Notre Dame used to have. And it's not all their fault. I mean, you look at last year's schedule, they tried, you start off at Florida state, you got USC, you got Wisconsin, you've got, I mean, you had some good teams. It's not your fault that those teams are down. I mean, and that that tends to happen. But it, they, they just haven't. Like we were having a discussion about Ian Book. And people say, oh, you know, I, Ian Book doesn't get enough credit. He won 30 games. And I'm like, Tony Rice beat more ranked teams in 1989 than Ian Book beating three years as a starter. That's not Ian Book's fault. You can only play who you play, who's on your schedule. But they've benefited from that. And then, you know, you beat up on those teams you're supposed to. You're going to have better records, which then helps you to sell the product better. Notre Dame is still a big brand, and there's a lot of people that don't want to admit that, but Notre Dame is still a big brand. USC is going to – we're going to see that with USC is there's this ball, Pac-12 stinks, nobody cares. Yeah, wait till USC gets a competent coach and the coaching staff, and all of a sudden they're going to start – they're not going to be missing on Kayvon Thibodeau the next time there's a Kayvon Thibodeau that comes around. And that's my point is, is you know, you've – but it's got to be – because USC is more similar to Notre Dame, in my view, than they are Alabama. And what I mean by that is the West Coast doesn't produce the volume of elite players that it used to. And I asked this question on my channel. When was the last time that the West Coast has produced a five-star offensive lineman? You know, Or California, I should say, has produced a five-star offensive lineman. And you could find a kid here, a kid there. They're not producing players there like they used to. 
USC can't just live in California the way that they used to. They're going to have to go national. And whereas Alabama doesn't have to leave like their little, you know, area code to get some great players. I mean, you know, Louisiana, Texas, Florida, they're all right there, the Carolinas. USC is going to have to to go national. And that's been true for a few years. Pete even started doing this, going out to Jersey to get Dwayne Jarrett, going down to Texas. Uh, not Pete didn't do this, but uh, it was, I think, Sarkeesian going down to Texas to get Ronald Jones. You have to leave the state a little bit more than you used to to get kids. And there's there's all types of reasons, you know, population shifts and a lot of kids that used to or in Arizona now would have been in California 15 years ago and all that other type of stuff. So USC is going to ha- you, you can't have success when you have to leave your region if you don't have a staff top to bottom that puts in work. And if you go to Alabama and you don't put in work in a recruiting trail, guess what happens a year later? You're looking for a new job. That was true under Urban. That's true under Dabo. If you're not going to put in the work, you're going to have to find somewhere else to go. And there wasn't that level of accountability at Notre Dame. And it sounds like that was true at USC. And that's really the biggest thing. I was. It's funny. I was asked this question today. Who's the wink link in recruiting for Notre Dame? And I'm like, right now, honestly, there isn't one because they're all putting in work. They're all having success in 23 and 24. And Notre Dame has to have that. They can't have success on the recruiting trail if they're not 10 deep because they don't have the built-in geographic advantages that some programs have. Those, And this has always been my problem with Brian Kelly. I sat down with Coach Freeman in an interview yesterday, and, and I asked him about some things, and, and we had an article up today. And all the things that Brian Kelly used to always use as excuses of why you can't win at Notre Dame, Marcus Freeman immediately points to as reasons why Notre Dame is going to win a championship. And that right there is the, the and it's not intentional per se. It's what he believes because that's what that's the mentality that Lou Holtz has. Brian Kelly never embraced Lou Holtz during his entire 12 years. Marcus hmm. Freeman's done it immediately. And the one thing that Coach Holtz is always about is you you in the, you talk to any Lou Holtz player, especially from like 88 to 93, and they'll say, Coach would look at the we had to go to class every day. It was hard for us. We had to take real classes. He would look at those things and use those as why we were going to kick the mess out of who we we're going to play because no one else is going to class as much as you are. No one's putting in the work you're doing. No one has to do this. No one has to do that. No one has to live in dorms without air conditioning. No one has to live in the normal, you know, gen pop, so to speak, of, of, of on campus like you do. And whether that was true or not in all those cases, they believed it was true. And so when they got to Saturday, they had a chip on their shoulder. They're like, nobody worked as hard as us. And then they would go out and beat Miami and beat Florida State and beat Michigan and and, and do all those type of things. And, and br- whereas Brian Kelly would use an excuse, like I remember when they went out and lost to Stanford at the end of 17 and Brian Kelly's like, well, you know, they had finals coming up and, you know, they, they've traveled a lot. And I, I had a couple coaches reach out to me. They were pissed. Like you're giving them excuses to settle for less. And that was the reason because Brian Kelly always had to have a reason why he didn't achieve success the way you should have. And it was never him. It was never, I shouldn't have hired Brian Van Gorder and kept him for three years. Like, that's an easy answer, right? Uh, it was always, well, it's this, it's that, it's the other thing. And and that's what Marcus Freeman has basically said, no, we're not doing that. We're not making those excuses. We're going to win because of Notre Dame, not in spite of Notre Dame. And Brian Kelly always looked at it as, I've, I've won in spite of Notre Dame. And that's why he ultimately uh, failed the ultimate standard of what it is at Notre Dame, which is, I don't care how many games you won. how many chan- He won as many national championships in Notre Dame as I did. I got to ask you about Marcus Freeman versus Lincoln Riley. And instead of asking you, okay, will this become McKay Parsegian too? Instead of asking you that, my, my actual question to you is, does this rivalry need to catch fire right away in order for Freeman versus Riley to attain, you know, mythological status the way uh, McKay Parsegian did? Or can these coaches go through a couple of transition years find their footing in like year three and become great? Do they need to be great right off the bat? That's my question. I think Notre Dame does more than USC Uh, because Marcus Freeman's walking to a situation where they went 11 and two last year. Now, again, 11 and two against win with wins over zero ranked teams, but it's still 11 and two. That's a different thing than four and eight. I, I don't think Lincoln Riley needs to beat Marcus Freeman or even be necessarily competitive with Marcus Freeman in year one to be ascending. If Notre Dame goes out and gets whipped by USC or loses to USC this year, it's it's going to be a bad look because you've dominated that series for the last six years for the most part. And it, with, what, 16 being the only exception, right? Notre Dame won in 15, 17, and then moving forward, USC beat them in 16. You know, 
you can't lose in year one, right? Like, I don't care what they've done. So I think for it to really catch fire, I think Notre Dame needs to keep doing what they've been doing and USC needs to catch them. There can't be an appearance that Notre Dame has taken a step back is my thing. Cause I think that would take some of the shine off as well. It needs to be about, cause that's what hurt Notre Dame. Right. And USC dominated them for years. And then when Notre Dame finally gets a win and starts kind of winning some games in the series, it's because USC is not good anymore. You know, the 2010 team wasn't good. The 2012 team wasn't that good. The 13 team wasn't that good. It, it, so it really wasn't until 17 that Notre Dame actually beat a USC team that was actually good, you know, and, and, and ranked high. So I, I think that's it. I think it's more so it's it's there's more pressure on Notre Dame to be good. I think USC can go through a couple building years. But the one thing is the games have been competitive for the most part since 17. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, the, the yeah. scores haven't always been as close. Like the, the, the 19 game wasn't as close as the final score, but it wasn't a blowout either. You know, uh, the 2015 game wasn't a blowout. I mean, Notre Dame won by 10, but USC had tied it early in the fourth quarter. Uh, the 18 game USC had a lead for I think they had Notre Dame took the lead right before halftime but USC was up like 10 nothing at one point in time in that game they've at least been competitive so I think that's a, a positive as far as just looking at from a rivalry standpoint I don't think USC has to win one the first couple of years I think they just need to like be good games where you feel like they belong on that field because even in some of the games where it's been a close game it was kind of obvious that Notre Dame was letting USC hang around more so than, wow, USC might beat Notre Dame. Like last year, mm-hmm. no point in time that I think, gee, USC yeah. might actually win this game. It, it was always like, when's Notre Dame going to start messing with them? When, like 28, 6, 18, same way. Like, yeah, USC jumped out. It's like, eh, Notre Dame shooting themselves in the foot, fumbling punts and all this. And then once they took control of the lines, they, they ran away with it. It, it. You can lose a game and, and kind of say, hey, we showed something. It, Notre Dame in 2017, losing to Georgia the way they did gave that team confidence that we can beat anybody because we have so many missed opportunities. We meaning I'm looking at from their standpoint, you know, we had so many missed opportunities. We could have beaten Georgia. We missed this. We did that. We dropped this ball and we still only lost by one. And that gave Notre Dame a confidence. I remember Drew Tranquil after the game, he kind of looked at his hoodie over. And if you guys know Drew Tranquil, he's a smiley, happy kid and, and all that. And he's been that way for the chargers, but he had his hoodie over his head and he goes, I feel really bad for the teams that we're about to play. And then they went hung 500 rushing yards on BC the next week, you know, and then went beat a a top 15 Michigan state team by 20 the next week. And it wasn't that close. It was like 38, 10 and Sparty fans are like filing out in the third quarter. I mean, you know, and they just, I mean, they just steamrolled everybody. They hammered USC. It wasn't until Miami that they kind of started to, that they slowed down in a big way. But I mean, Notre Dame wasn't just beating people during that stretch. They were destroying people. And it was that mentality of, yes, we lost, but we showed we can play with anybody. I think what USC needs to do, because it is the last game of the regular season, is go into that offseason with some momentum. Hey, we might have lost to Notre Dame, but, man, we went toe-to-toe with those guys, and they've dominated us really for years. We can go do something. And I think that kind of momentum, it's like, is did Notre Dame have more momentum after the 14 season or after the 15 season? It was after the 14th season when they beat LSU in the Music City Bowl. They had lost five games in a row, including a loss at home to Northwestern, who sucked that year. But why did they have momentum? Because they won the last game of the year. 2015, Notre Dame was a top 10 team. Their only losses were to top five teams, but they lost their last two games, and there was no energy going into that season. And then next year they go 4-8. and eight. So I don't think you necessarily have to win to get momentum, but it has to be one of those things where you walk the, uh, off that field thinking, you know what? If we make a couple improvements, a couple wrinkles here and there, you know what? We're, we're almost there. And then with Notre Dame being a con- perennial top five day team, that makes you think like, hey, we're close to that. So I think as long as they do that, I think that USC can look at this and say, hey, this rivalry is going to be something again. And then it'll make it fun. Because I, I think we can agree that we both want that to be true. It helps both sides for them to be good. It doesn't help. Like, what's the big win that USC is going to have that anyone's going to care about with the East Coast bias that does exist? Whether you like it or not, it exists. You know, what's the big win that they can have other than the Notre Dame game? What's the resume builder that just that, Utah? That's the right. only one. But is that really a game that for people like, let's be honest, there's a lot of voters. There's a lot of people, ESPN, whatever, that that don't look at Utah the way they should. Right. Sure. And like, like they don't get the love that they should. Like, like, how did Utah play with Ohio State? Like, did you watch Utah last year? Like, that's a good football team. You know, after the first month, that was a good football team. I'm talking about developing a a national reputation of USC's back. 
Of course. It's not beating Utah or Oregon. It's going to be beating of Notre course. Dame. That's of the course. key. No argument there. Of course, I'd hope that doesn't happen, but <laughs> that's yeah. the game where yeah. it would need yeah. to happen. You're absolutely right. <laughs> Yeah. Brian, you took us uh, from the Marcus Freeman narrative all the way through to, yeah, what it's going to take for USC to establish itself as the power again and what that needs to look like in this game. I'm going to take you back to Freeman. And you, you do understand, for me personally, and then based on what I see out of the chat, uh, I'm about 90% that Mark, uh, certain that Marcus Freeman is going to at least accomplish what Brian Kelly did. He will at least keep this as a 10 win team year to year. Uh, if not better, if not seriously compete for national championships and probably win one. Okay. You do understand that we've seen Ty Willingham. There were a lot of expectations and that was, that felt like it was a guy with Yes, an up-and-comer, one of the emerging great coaches, young coaches in college football that's going to bring all this energy. Uh, Charlie Weiss, for different reasons, there was a credibility factor that, oh, he's, he's bringing a new level, new concept of football from the NFL to Notre Dame. So we've seen this before, and with Marcus Freeman, that, again, he has yet to prove anything. That's not his fault, but he's an unknown commodity mm -hmm. compared to a rock solid known commodity sure. well and who's the one coach during since Lou Holtz left that has had success it was a guy who'd been a head coach for over 20 years and Brian Kelly a guy who knew how to run a program so I look I think that's a very fair thing to say until Marcus Freeman goes out there and proves that he can coach at the level that he can recruit there's going to be questions and there should be just like there were questions about Ryan Day taking over 19 and Dabo taking over when he took over and Lincoln Riley taking over at Oklahoma and, and I think there's a dynamic for Lincoln Riley, too, which is a, another conversation maybe for another time. But there's a lot that Marcus Freeman has to prove, right? Because the reason so many Notre Dame fans were soured on – well, there's a lot of reasons. But one of the reasons a lot of Notre Dame fans had soured on Brian Kelly is, well, the standard in Notre Dame isn't to be 11-2 and two every year or 10-2 and two every year. The standard in Notre Dame is to win a championship. And not only are we not winning one, again, looking from a fan standpoint, we're not even competitive when we get on that stage. And I think that's that was the disappointing thing, and, and that was the same in 2021 and 2020 and as it was back in 2012. So that's really ultimately what Marcus Freeman needs to do if he wants to prove something is that. But until he does, it's, you know, it, it what's different? And, and I think that the reason I think he'll at least continue what Brian Kelly did is if he's not as good of a coach as Brian Kelly, which I have no idea, he hasn't really coached a game with his staff, he's definitely going to have more talented rosters. That That's the reality of it. And, and when you look at some of the hires, I mean, there, there were not a lot of people that, that – there was a lot of Notre Dame fans who weren't happy about, about Bob Davey being hired, right? Uh, when you look at when Ty was hired, Ty was not their first choice. They actually hired another coach before Ty, and then he got fired because of the resume deal, and then they're scrambling, and, you know, Ty comes in. Ty had, like, one good season at Stanford, right? And I think a lot of the hype was more of we hope he's good, so then you kind of build up what you hope. And I think that's what's going on with Marcus Freeman as well, Mark, is – there's a lot of people building up what they hope he'll be, not what he is, because we don't know what he is. We know he's a really good defensive coordinator. Well, you know what? There's been a lot of good coordinators that weren't good head coaches, and we don't know what he's going to be. But I think the thing that gives you hope is, okay, is he doing the things that successful coaches do to win? And what is that? Accountability throughout your program. That was not something Brian Kelly did enough of in his career. Are you putting a great emphasis on – on building a complete staff, not something Brian Kelly did. It was very rare that Brian Kelly had a staff. You looked at and said, boy, there's really no big holes. Maybe not everybody's great, but there's no big holes. There's always glaring holes on Brian Kelly's coaching staff. Those things Coach Freeman is checking all the boxes on. Now, can he prepare a team throughout the year to get ready for success in the fall? We don't know. Can he properly build a 20-plus camp fall schedule to get ready for success on September 3rd and then not kind of – you know, use all your ammo in that one game and you're mentally and emotionally spent for the next two months. That's another danger that you can get from a coach who maybe is a first year coach. So there's a lot of that that we don't know about what he's going to do. And I think that's why I think the staff that he hired was good. And that's one of the questions I asked him yesterday. It'll, it'll come out in our preseason magazine was, did you hire your staff with that in mind, knowing that you are a first year coach? And to a degree he did. I mean, that's why you bring it out golden. 
You know, Al Golden knows what it's like to coach at a premier program with high expectations. That's why you bring in, you know, Harry Heastan, who's a veteran coach. So you can just kind of say, hey, look, we don't have to worry about the O-line anymore, right? He's, he's good to go. It's why you bring in Dylan McCullough, who's been in the NFL, who's won a Super Bowl, who wants to be a head coach himself, you know, who's an, an older coach. And then you balance that with some of the younger guys like Tommy Reese and Chancey Stuckey and, and Al Washington, guys like that. I, I think there was a lot to that. And I also think he surrounded himself with – he's embraced more of the – he understands that I don't know what I don't know, but Lou Holtz knows it and Jim Trestle knows it. And he's, I think he's relying on those things, but at the end of the day, Lou Holtz and Jim Trestle aren't going to help him make a fourth and one call, right? They're not going to help him make a, you know, uh, what speech should I give at halftime or what personnel changes should I make? Or, you know, those type of things, those are ultimately going to be the things that determine Marcus Freeman's success. If I have a coach that I think is good now, but he doesn't have success. Do I, do I make the move right away? Or do I hang on to him for two years too long? Those are all the things that are to be determined. But the things that we can evaluate now, I've been impressed with all of them. Now he's got to show, he's got to prove that he can be successful in the unknowns. And I mean, no one can should be able to look you in the face and say, oh, he's going to be great. I think, but I don't know. Just like I don't know if Lincoln Riley is going to be success, as successful USC as he was in Oklahoma. He walked into a situation where Oklahoma was kind of a well-oiled machine when Lincoln Riley took over, right? This is a completely different animal. And I think those are always the things that you look at and say, we don't know how this is going to go. We don't know how this is going to go. We know what Lincoln Riley did when he took over here and things, but we don't know here. And it's the same thing for Marcus Freeman. We He did a great job as a D coordinator. He's done a great job recruiting. He's had a good staff. But can he coach in the areas that separate the good coaches from the great coaches? I have no idea. We'll, we'll find out. But and some of those are the reasons why I get reminded in the chat that I ranked uh, Lincoln Riley as the 11th best coach in college football, and that really irks some USC fans. 